Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, just before we went for our break, we were um, studying chapter one of uh, receiving God's guidance. Okay, uh, we are now moving to page number seven. Okay, um, there are some things that remain unknown. God reveals things in our lives. He guides us. He directs us. He teaches us. He reveals things from his word from us, for us. But there are some things that remain unknown. Like we read in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works of his law. Okay, so there are only some things that God has reserved only for himself. So we must be willing to be comfortable, even if we don't have answers to all our questions. But yes, uh, we have que answers to most questions that pertains to our life, to God's guidance, to his will, plan and purpose in our lives. But some things which is not revealed to us, we can just live with this peace, knowing that, you know, this unanswered area or this unanswered question is maybe because God knows that, you know, it's not relevant for us to know or important for us to know and uh, that you know we can have even peace even in that situation which is beyond our understanding okay so that's this is a peace that we have even when we don't understand and so we just have to let go of it and say god you know you know what's best you do what is best because you're a good god you're a loving God, and I know the plans you have for me are plans for that gives me a hope and a future, and I just trust you with it, and just you know move on with what He is indicating, what He is directing you, what He is leading you and revealing in your life. Okay, now um, we move on to Romans chapter twelve, verses one and two. Where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Okay. Now, some people take this verse, especially verse. Um, Two and say that God's, there are three categories of God's will. God's will is good, pleasing, and accept, acceptable. Sorry, what do you think? Is God's will, three? are there three categories of God's will? No, I have already explained. There is no three categories of God's will. God's will is good, pleasing, and acceptable. For example, if I take an apple and show you an apple, I say this apple is red. It smells sweet and it's very, very tasty. Now, am I talking about three different apples? One is red, one is smelling sweet, one is tasty? No, all three are the characteristics of that same apple, right? In the same way, God's will for our lives is good, pleasing, and, and acceptable, okay? So... There is no three categories of God's will, okay? Now, also people say that by looking at this word acceptable, they say that, you know, it, uh, uh, it also can mean the permissive will of God, okay? So here it's not talking about acceptable does not mean the permissive will of God. That means the free or the loose or, you know, the tolerant will of God. God's will is good, pleasing, and acceptable. It does not mention that his will is permissible. permissible, uh, uh, And God's will can also be a permissive will. No. And if you want to understand that, we also have to look at it in the light of the rest of uh, scripture. We see elsewhere in Paul's writings or in Jesus's uh, teachings or his life or ministry, we don't anywhere see there is a permissive will of God. Okay. I'll just give you some example and then take your question. Now, for example, you know, um, people say that, um, you know, uh, okay, for, for example, look at Jesus's teaching, right? Um, 
he did not say tell anyone who came to him that you know let the permissive will of god you know happen in your life if he ha if you have to remain sick okay he says he does not say well maybe it's a permissive will of god for you to remain sick okay but what does he do when everyone comes to him for healing the bible the gospel says he healed them all okay he healed everyone who came to him he does not tell anyone hey you know i think it's god's permissive permissive will for you to remain sick does jesus tell that to anybody no when the crowds came the multitudes came he healed them all he healed everyone who came to him in faith so there is no uh, such thing as the permissive will of god now some people say what about the situation like the the fall of man okay why did god permit it right adam and eve he could have stopped adam and eve from eating that fruit right so why didn't god stop it okay or um, was it the permissive will of god for them to you know fall into sin what about the israelites you know god said i am your king you don't need a king but he ultimately gave them a king so he's saying they're saying there is a permissive will of god so even in the wilderness when they asked for meat they were craving to eat meat god gave them quail so he's saying hey that's the permissive will of god he permitted it he allowed it okay so the question we need to ask is was that perfect was it the perfect will of god was it the perfect will of god for adam and eve to sin to allow them to sin no was it god's perfect will for the israelites to have a king no he knew what the king is going to do he told them if you have a king the king is going to rule over you and make you slaves right so but why did god permit it yes very good he's given us a free will to choose people were stubborn god has given people the free will to choose if you read psalm 115 verse 16 it says the heavens belong to the lord the earth he has given to man right so when he's given the earth to man he gave instructions to adam and eve in the garden subdue and take dominion over the earth that means he's entrusted the earth to man this is our dominion this is our jurisdiction we exercise our authority and god in his sovereignty in his divine will and plan and purpose he will not step out of what he has planned to man and we are responsible for the choices and the will and the decisions that we make yes when we go to him he guides us he leads us he helps us but it does not mean that is the permissive will of god okay now for example i'll just give you an example you know our city uh, every city has a law that murder is not allowed yes or no yes or no but do people still go ahead and murder yes so people still go ahead and murder does that mean that the government has a permissive law allowing murder no the law still remains the same murder is not allowed so even if murder happens it does not mean that there is a permissive law okay similarly in the realm of god in the spiritual realm there is one will of god and that is the good acceptable and perfect will of god if you're not in the will of god that means you are out of the will of god and there is nothing called the permissive will of god you're either in or out for god it's either white or black there are no shades of gray okay so uh, the reason why people think there is a permissive will of God is because they misunderstand and they misinterpret the scriptures. Okay, so we need to know that God's will for us is good, acceptable, and pleasing at all times in all circumstances. Yes. What What is permissive will? Permissive will means you know um, uh, it's not. It's like okay, God allowed it. God permitted it. Like for example. Uh, you tell your child, you know, um, 
yeah it's like you know uh, you you you, you tell your child you know uh, don't put your you know children go and uh, use the take the knife or you know they uh, they try to put their uh, finger in in some hole you know the plug sockets or something like that and the parents are saying don't do it don't do it don't do it so finally the child is not listening and saying okay you want to do it you do it when you put your hand in that the sun you get the shock then don't tell mama didn't tell you okay then the child is vigilant so because the mother said okay go ahead and do it doesn't mean it's the it's not it's, it's the, the the will of the mother that she's permitting you to uh, do it right so um, the the mother is telling the child study 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 the exams are coming the child is not studying saying okay if you don't want to study don't study you're going to fail in the test doesn't mean the mother wants the child not to study you're permitting her not to study no it's just like so you want to do, go ahead and do follow your own stubbornness your own choice i'm just allowing you to do but we can't say that it's can't grow up and say if my mother permitted me not to study right it's not the permiss it's not like you know she permitting you or giving you the allowance or the freedom to do it yes now did you understand yeah so people say that you know god gave the israelites a king even though he said no king he permitted it that means there is something called a permissive will of god now why did god allow it because he says go ahead you want to do what you want to do it's your choice go ahead and do what you do you face the consequences right okay okay so we'll um, move on um our responsibility so god leads us and guides us but we have our responsibility what is our responsibility is we need to seek uh, god's will okay so seek and you shall seek and you shall find yes okay so just give me a minute uh, yeah so we need to seek god's will okay yeah okay God invites us to seek him when we seek him we find the revelations of the things that he wants us to do Jeremiah chapter 29 was 12 and 13 says God says call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart so when we seek God we will find him when will we find him when will we receive answers and guidance when we seek him whole heartedly okay so god is looking for a good heart response of us seeking him whole heartedly and jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 says god says call on me and i will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know okay so our seeking leads to finding or when we seek we will find when we earnestly desire to know to enquire to know what is his will to know what is his direction and you know um, then we will receive the guidance then we will receive the understanding okay matthew chapter 7 verse 7 and 8 says ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find knock and the door shall be open to you okay so uh, you know everyone who asks will receive those who seek will find those who knock the door shall be open so that's a promise but we need to seek god whole heartedly okay also seeking his guidance during the normal course of things okay each step of the day any time just seek his guidance hear from him you know tune your hearts and your minds and your ears to hearing from him also when you need to make major decisions in your life it will require some time to you know spend time in fasting and praying you know um, uh, it might be a week it might be a, a month you know extra time of reading god's word extra time of praying and those times when we are making major decisions in life it's important to seek god's time uh, seek him during the special times in our life okay also sometimes when we are not expecting god to guide us he can guide us and lead us okay we are not uh, necessarily looking for guidance or seeking guidance but 
God breaks in, speaks to us, reveals things to us, and he can talk to us and tell us what he is planning to do, what is coming ahead, you know, or what is there in the future. Okay, so those are unexpected God moments. Like, for example, some, you know, once I remember God waking me up at around around 3.30 or something and asking me to pray and asking me to pray for my father and my sister. And I didn't know what to pray for. So the best time, best thing to do at that time is to pray in tongues because you don't know what to pray. And you pray in tongues, you pray in the spirit, you're praying in a perfect accordance to God's will. And I, I was just praying and I was, you know, intensely pouring out knew something is going to happen but i didn't know what and later on in that day they had an accident both of them but it was not serious and it was nothing very major and then i realized oh god woke me up in the morning uh, to pray so sometimes you know unexpected god moments when he's directing us leading us to do some things okay um which we will also study more when we uh, look ahead in the chapters to come okay the next thing is listening. It's important for us to listen. John chapter 10, you know, verses 1 to 5 and verse 27. It says that the sheep hear his voice, right? The sheep are so tuned to the shepherd's voice. When the shepherd calls them, they just run towards the shepherd because they identify the shepherd uh, voice. They will not go behind a stranger because they don't identify his voice voice okay so it's important that you know sometimes we say hey i'm asking god but he's not guiding me god is speaking to us but we need to listen we need to tune our hearts and minds to listen to god okay so we need to ask ourselves are we in the right place the right time you no know, you know listening to god's voice or we are are we entertaining the wrong voices or the voices of strangers in our hearts and our minds okay and psalm 23 verses 3 to 4 the lord promises us that he will uh, guide us using his rod and his staff so the shepherd's voice the shepherd's rod and staff are different pictures that god uses uh, to show us that he is guiding us as his sheep uh, to keep us on the right path okay so sometimes we see the, the shepherd leads from front, right? You've seen the shepherd walking in the front and the sheep walking from behind, okay? And the, sh the sheep are listening to his voice and they just follow the shepherd. Sometimes you see the sheep are going in the front and the shepherd is right at the back. Why is that? Because that is a very familiar path. The sheep have walked on this path for many days. They know the path. So the shepherd allows them to walk in the front. And the shepherd at the back, you can see him with the stick, right? The shepherd's staff, he'll just be not tapping some of them who are going astray, some of them who are you know, going uh, in the wrong direction. He'll pull them up and, you know, he'll get them to direct them. So God wants to direct us and lead us and guide us. He's our good shepherd, but we need to listen and follow him. Okay. The next one is obedience. Okay. It's very important that, you know, for us to receive from God, to know his will, to know the way he's guiding us, it's important for us to, uh, you know, come with a heart full of obedience and faith, okay? Sometimes it's painful in the flesh to obey God, but we need to say, God, whatever it is, you know, even it's difficult for me, I'm willing to obey you, okay? Um, it says here that Proverbs chapter 3, verse 32, it says the secret counsel is with the upright, right? God reveals his secret counsel to those who are upright. Who is an upright man? One who is doing right in the eyes of God, one who is obedient, who is submissive, who is willing to obey the will of the Father, okay? So, you know, you're upright, and your son, God, will reveal his secret plans and his will to you. Okay. So that is chapter one. Um, we'll move on to chapter two. Anyone has any questions? Shani says, do we always have, 
do we always have to fast when we have to make a major decision? Can we make a major decision without fasting? Yes, you can make a major decision without fasting. It's not um, a requisite that you have to fast. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible. Um, but yes, fasting is just saying, God, you know, I'm actually giving up uh, the desire to eat, uh, spending my time in cooking, spending my time in doing things. Um, you know, I just want to come and, you know, like um, Mary, just sit at your feet and listen to you. So that is the heart attitude. But if you're not uh, uh, able to fast, not willing to fast, that doesn't matter. God looks at your heart more than your, uh, you know, your outward rituals and what you do. I hope that helps, Shani. Any questions? Chapter one. So you're excited that God is willing to and, you know, more than uh, desirous to lead you, guide you. Yes, yes, yes. And he has got good, pleasing and, and acceptable for uh, will for each plan and purpose for each one of your life. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to chapter two, a very interesting chapter. We're going to look at David's life. Uh, David was known as what? A man after God's own heart. Okay. And look at what uh, God says about him. Okay. He says, he's a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Imagine God telling this about a man. Here is this man, David, who, do, who will do everything after my will. Okay, what confidence for God to say that David will do all my will and calls David as a man after his own heart. If you look at Acts chapter 13, verse 36, Paul, when he's preaching and he's talking about David, he says, for David, after he has served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. That means he died. So that means David served God by the will of God. Okay, he did God's will. He followed God's assignment, plan, purpose for his life, okay? And uh, why do we say that David was somebody who did the will of God? It was because, anyone has any answer? Why was David known as somebody who did the will of God? He was obedient. He was very close to God, okay? He always uh, sought God. He always listened to him. He used to seek him day and night. He was repentant. His heart was pure. He had a right heart attitude. Yes, we see that David inquired of God frequently for every decision that he made. Okay. And we also know we uh, when we were we were studying this chapter about remember Paul, David, right? Moses, you know, the years that God takes to uh, prepare us, the lesson on preparation. Yes, remember we studied about David and uh, Moses and uh, Paul, and then we studied his life and how many years it took. So we, and I remember I told you that David had a good reputation among the people that he was courageous, good looking. He was somebody uh, who, who God was with him and somebody very skillful in playing the harp. And we also see that after David killed Goliath, that people spoke of him as somebody who behaved wisely and was highly favored. Okay. And um, so we see that, you know, uh, David was anointed as king, but David had to run away for his life, right? We, I, I, I walked you past or took you through all of these stages of his life. And we said that for uh, many years, he was living in the wilderness running away from King Saul. But during that time, God brought 400 men. Remember I told you that? 400 men to David who would become his strong friends, warriors, and became later on generals in his army. Okay. So with that background, uh, we will look at a few instances in David's life, how he inquired of God and what we can learn okay so uh, first samuel chapter 23 verses 1 to 5 you know um yeah 
David, uh, you're right. Uh, Shani says David didn't inquire from God when he slept with a married woman. Therefore, he did not inquire from God on everything because he slept with a married woman. Yes, I, we're not saying that, uh, you know, every instance he inquired of God, most of the instances he inquired of God. And that is why scripture says, that's why God even says that he's a man after his own heart. That was God's testimony of David. And also, uh, God says, he's a man who will do all my will. Okay, so if God has to say it, that means David would have inquired of God in most instances. And God also knows that, you know, as human beings, we are not perfect. He's mindful of us and uh, such a loving God. In spite of what David did, he f and David, you know, asked for forgiveness. God uh, forgives him and God uses him mightily and fulfills his promise to David. That is the heart of God that we need to see and also invite for ourselves, okay? It's not possible for us to be in the spirit always. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it is possible for us to be in the spirit always because the Holy Spirit is always living in us, right? When the Holy Spirit is always living in us, he tells us, Hey, what you're saying, what you're doing, uh, your attitude, what you're thinking is not right. Yes, the Holy Spirit is living in us always. And it, the Bible says that we need to walk and keep in step with the Spirit at all times. Yes. I hope that helped Elkanah. Sometimes the Spirit, Holy Spirit will tell us, but we will seek to do what we will. We will step out. We will make the wrong choices. We face the consequences. We come back. The Holy Spirit corrects us and receives us and teaches us. Okay. So we look at uh, one instance here in 1 Samuel chapter 23. The Philistines are fighting against Kilia. And David inquires of God and asks him, God, should I go and attack the Philistines? And what does God tell him? It says, go attack the Philistines and save Kilia. Okay. So when David said this to his men, all the men in Judah were very, very afraid. Okay. So what did David do? He goes back to the Lord a second time. He inquires of God once again. And God tells him, yes, go, go down to Kelia and I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David tells this to his men. He goes and they won, they win the, they won the victory. Okay. They become victorious. And that is when they become more confident in their leader. They know that their leader is inquiring of God. Their leader is asking of God. And he's doing what God is telling them. And we have the victory. Okay. So what do we learn from this? Okay. We learn that, you know, as uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in husband and wife, you make decisions or in a family, you make decisions, you uh, make a decision, or uh, you make a decision for your children, your, your uh, other better half, your spouse is not willing, is not going alongside you with that, or your parents are not coming alongside with you for that, or you're a pastor of a church, you're making a decision, the committee or the people are not, um, you know, willing to take it on um, and or, you know, uh, you are a leader in a, in your uh, in your place of work, and you give them, hey, we're going to do this, and your team is not willing to take it up. What do you do? You go back to the Lord, say, God, I think I heard this from you. Can you give me a confirmation from your word, or you know, in my spirit? And then God speaks to you. You know the confirmation. You come back and say, hey, I, you know, I think this is from God. I think this is a leading. Let's go ahead and do it. Tell them what is the good features of it. What is the end result? And go ahead and implement it. And when you go ahead and do it and your team sees a success, they will know the Lord is with you. They will have more confidence in you. Okay. So that's what we can learn from that uh, in instance in David's life. Another instance we'll see in David's life is in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 8. Now, we see here that, you know, David and his men, uh, they were away from their place where they were staying, that is Ziklag. They go away somewhere else. They come back to Ziklag, and they come back to Ziklag. They see that all of their men, their, their children, their wives, their animals, their property, everything is taken away um, by the Amalekites. Okay. 
and uh, the men, the 400 men, or now it's like six, six, 600 men, all were so upset. They weep and they weep because till they have no strength to cry. And they're so angry. They get angry with David. They're all talking among themselves. They're saying, hey, let's kill David. All this has happened because of David. Now imagine David hears this, right? He himself is heartbroken and sad and weeping and mourning because both his wives are taken, his children is taken, and all his, you know, the, 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 the men there, the, his men and all their families is taken. As a leader, he felt so responsible. What does David do? He does not go and tell them, hey, you know, uh, how can you think of killing me? You know, I'm your leader. Or, you know, don't you think I also lost my wife and children? He doesn't do that. What does David do? He strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. Beautiful, right? He strengthened himself. He needed strength. What do you, how do you think he would have strengthened himself? Praying, playing the harp, just worshipping God, crying out in that worship, you know, praising God, but crying out of a heart, broken heart of, you know, giving God a broken heart of worship, just praying, just pouring out his love to God. And then what he does, he asks the priest to bring the ephod and David inquires of the Lord and God tells him and asks God, shall I pursue, pursue the troop and overtake them? And what does God say? Pursue them for you can surely overtake them and you will recover everything from them. So David tells his men, they go, they bring back all their wives and children and all of their, um, all their belongings, they bring it back and they come back to Ziklag. Okay. So what do we learn from uh, this? A powerful lesson that in life, we can also face severe setbacks and crisis. Okay. We can uh, face the deaths, the Red Sea. We can face the wall. We can face the mountain. There is no way out. But what do we do at those times? We don't cry and moan and weep and give up but we strengthen ourselves in the Lord, our God. And once we are strengthened, we, we hear from God what he's telling us and ask his guidance and direction, how to handle the situation and what action to take. And the Lord will lead us and guide us. Okay. We look at another uh, incident in the life of David. Second Samuel chapter 2 verses 1 to Four. And now this uh, incident I've already spoken when I was teaching you fulfilling God's purpose for your life. You know, David was already anointed as king by Samuel, um, but he's running away for his life. When, when King Saul dies, what does David do? Remember, I told you, what does David do? King Saul dies, what does David do? He cries, okay? Sorry? He wrote a psalm? Hey. <laughs> that was a good thinking, eh, though. <laughs> yeah, he wrote a psalm. He was heartbroken. He was mourning. What else did he do? What else did he do? He asked God, God, what should I do now? Shall I go up to Hebron? Right? So what God tells him? Yes, you know, it says go up. So he goes up and what does they do? The men of Judah make him as king, right? And then after that, we see that, you know, after seven years, you know, all of Israel make him king of uh, the entire Israel. But what does David do? He doesn't say, God, I'm happy living like a, you know, like a, that uh, jungle book, uh, huh? Tarzan. You know, jumping from tree to tree, running around the forest, enjoying the scenery, beauty, uh, you know, having this casual life, but going on to take the responsibility of king. He says, God, what should I do now? So, you know, shall I go up and take any cities of Judah? And God says, go up. And, and he said, go to Hebron. And when he goes to Hebron, he is crowned king there by one tribe and then by the rest of the tribes of Israel. Okay. So uh, we see here that, you know, uh, even though David was running for his life, but we see his in inquires of God. He asked God, should I relocate to any of the cities? And then he relocates and, you know, we see that he is fulfilling God's purpose for his life of becoming a king. 
And then he was a, very, a step closer to becoming the king of entire Israel. Okay, so what do we learn from this? God leads us and guides us even as we move on in seasons of life. We transition, right? You transition from a baby to a child, uh, to, a, uh, to a teenager, to a young adult, to a youth, to an adult now. You will transition into various other stages in your life, okay? And you need God's guidance. You need to know his will. So, and also you need to know how to fulfill God's will and plan and purpose for each season. So like David, you need to inquire of God. Okay. Another instance we see in uh, David's life is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. If you look in your books, page number, um, page number 21. Okay. So we see here that the Philistines have come to fight against David. You know, Philistines, they heard that David was anointed as king over all Israel. They come and they fight against him. Okay. And what does David do? What does David do? Come on, what does David do? He inquires of God. He says, God, shall I go up and, uh, you know, fight against the Philistines? And he says, God, will you deliver them into my hands? And what does God say? Go, I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. Hands. So David goes and he defeats them, okay? And then what happens is, you know, again the Philistines come upon him again. They come upon him again the second time, the same place to fight against David. What do you think David did this time? He again inquired of God. He did not, you know, um, be very confident this time. Okay, based on what happened in the past victory, you know, not say, okay, God told me last time, go and fight, I'll give you victory. This time also he'll give me victory. He did not do that. He did not assume. Okay, he went back to the Lord and asked God, God, what shall you, what shall I do now? You know, David inquired the Lord and God, you know what he says? He gives him a strategy this time. How to fight against the Philistine. So this time, he, last time he says, go fight, I'll help you win the battle. This time he gives him the strategy. Imagine if David would not have inquired of the Lord, he wouldn't have got the right strategy, he would have most probably lost the battle. And God tells him, gives him the strategy, but also tells him that he is going to send him the heavenly army to help him fight the battle. Knowing that this time the Philistines have come on full force to take on David. So David, God is saying that he is going to send the heavenly host, the heavenly army to fight against him. The heavenly armies are going to back him up to fight this time. Okay. So what do we learn from this? An important lesson that we learn is that even as we walk in kingdom authority, God has given us the keys of the kingdom. You know what keys signify? God says, I have given you the keys of the kingdom in Matthew. Yes, Jesus says, keys means what? Authority. Yes, keys signify authority. God has given us authority over the enemy, Satan, and all his demonic forces. He has given us every weapon of warfare that we need to use to overcome the enemy. But sometimes we also need to go to God to receive the strategies to fight our enemy. God has given us the weapons. But we also need to ask God, God, what is the weapon that I need to use to fight Satan this time? He's come against me full force, God. This is what is happening in my life. What do I need to do? So God will give you the strategy how you can fight, how you can stand firm, and how you can have dominion over your enemy. Okay? Amen? Right? Okay? We look at another incident in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. Nice narratives and stories from um, King, uh, King David's life. Okay. Now, everything was going well in King David's uh, life as king, his reign as king. But we see that for three years there was famine. Okay. And, you know, famine can be very distressing for people and for the king. So after three years, David was waiting, 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 maybe praying to God. But nothing is happening three years up. So finally, he inquires of 
God. So you see here also, David is showing that he is fully human. If he had inquired the first year of the famine, God would have given him the answer. But he would have thought, okay, one year, it, you know, God will remove it. The famine will go. Two years, then he would have thought, now it will go. But three years, it did not go. Then he inquires of God. So sometimes, as human beings, we also work in our flesh, but we realize and we come to God. So we see that, you know, this famine came, and so he inquires of God, and God tells him that King Saul had violated the commitment that he had made to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites, you know, helped the Israelites to get into the promised land, but they did not get into the promised land. They stayed on the other side of the Jordan. And, uh, you know, Israel had promised them to protect them, but you know, they failed to do so. And so God was punishing what Saul did in the time of David. Okay. So when David realized the mistake, how did he realize the mistake? Because God showed it to him because he inquired of God. And God said, you know, uh, uh, you know, this is the reason why the famine is happening. So David, what does he do? He repents. He restores things with the Gibeonites and immediately the famine stops. Okay. So what do we learn from this? Okay, When things seem to be going wrong in your life for no obvious reason, right? just one after the other, there is some problem or the other coming in your family, in your life, in your workplace, whatever, you need to ask God, God, what is the reason? What is the cause? Why is it happening? Okay. So then God will reveal to you. And what should you do? You need to take the necessary steps and the action to resolve things so that things can change in your life okay so we see different ways that um, of inquiring of god you know uh, you know he, sometimes david directly asked god you know sometimes he used the uh, ephod the urim the tumim you know uh, through the prophets that were around david to inquire of god okay and um, we see also men of God, the priests also played a large part in helping David to find out what God's will or, or plan and purpose was for his life at that time. But for us, we don't need all of this ephod. We don't need the urim, the tumim, the tumim okay, to know what, how do we, how can we know God's will for our, our lives or how can we know what God is guiding us and leading us to do in situations and circumstances of our life, what has God given us? Sorry? Prayer. What has God given us? His word. Yes, his word. And what else? Two important things. The word and the, the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit and the word is something that God has given to us. So we don't need to put lots. We don't need to cast lots. We don't have to put the chits and say yes, no. And God, if I'm choosing whichever skit, chit I'm choosing, that is the answer from you. No, we don't do those things. Why? They did it in the old time past, in the Old Testament, because they did not have the word. They did not have the Holy Spirit. But we don't take that now. We have God's word. We have the Holy Spirit. And that is how God leads us. And when we inquire of God, he directs us and leads us. Okay. So some beautiful lessons that we can learn from David's life and how he inquired of God. Okay. So I think in every point of our life, whether it's small decisions or major decisions or big decisions, we need to inquire from God. Right. Any questions? Okay, Saubhagya says, how do we hear God's voice or counsel from God, whether he will talk to us in dream or directly to us? Okay, so Excuse we already me. looked at it in fulfilling God's purpose for your life. How does God speak to us? How does he give us his counsel? Through visions and dreams, okay, through his word, okay, counsel of people. But we said even if there's counsel from people, we have to go back and confirm it from his word. The Holy Spirit will also speak to us as an inner confirmation. Sometimes we can have peace. Sometimes uh, we can have, if uh, you know there's restlessness, that means God is saying, no, wait, don't go ahead and do it. Sometimes he can talk to us through vision and dreams. He can talk to us even through people um, or some words that he puts in our mind. Uh, we, can, uh, we can hear from 
God. Uh, you know, we don't hear the audible voice of God, but we hear the inner, um, you know, uh, yeah, inner assurance, the inner witness, like we learned in fulfilling God's purpose, inner witness or inner assurance. You have that deep inner assurance. Yes, this is what God is telling me to do. That would be as a confirmation. I hope that helps, Sobhagya. Okay, thank you. Shani says, what if we ask God what is going on and he doesn't give us an answer? I know people who ask God what to do in a bad situation for years and don't get an answer. What do you think? Shani's question, did you all hear it? Shani's question is, what if we ask God what is going on and he doesn't give us an answer? I know people who ask God what to do in a bad situation for years and don't get an answer. Keep on praying, okay? What else? Try to, look what you are doing. Try to look at what you are doing wrong, what where have you faltered? You know, if God is correcting your heart attitude, some of the wrong motives, um, you know, correcting your attitude or your character or your mindset, your thinking. But we also uh, read, right, I think it was in um, Deuteronomy, right, uh, 29 was 29. There are some things that God will reveal to us, something he will not choose to reveal. Okay, so sometimes he won't answer. What do we do at that time? We just rest in peace knowing that God knows best and he will reveal at the right time. Okay, what to do in a bad situation? Uh, when bad situations are bad, maybe we are not listening, we are not obedient, God is speaking to us, we are not willing to listen, we are not willing to give up our bad attitude, our wrong attitude, our wrong lifestyles, and that is why we can't hear from God. Or there can be some sin that is hindering, and that is why we are not able to hear from God. Okay, So the problem lies with us and not from God. Sometimes when we don't hear from God, we're saying, God, do you want me to stay in the same job, continue with this job, with this hard, difficult boss? You don't hear from him. That means God is saying, stay where I have asked you to stay till I ask you to leave. Okay? So that can also be a, a, a thing that God can be telling us. I hope that helps Shani. Okay? Shani says, there are people who say they do not hear the audible voice from God. However, you said that we don't hear the audible voice of God. Yeah, some people say that they do hear the audible voice of God. They, um, but I think it's uh, Samuel who heard the audible voice of God. The others usually, you know, uh, you know, don't hear the audible voice of God. But the way God speaks in our spirit, man, it's like we feel that God, because we hear in our spirit senses. So we say, hey, we hear. I've heard from. God or God is speaking to me because that is how we need to articulate and say what God is saying, saying, hey, God told me this or God spoke to me. It's not like he spoke in a loud, audible voice. We hear the real voice of God. It's maybe an inner impression or that inner voice that, you know, knowing for sure that it's God uh, really speaking uh, to us. I'm not denying that God cannot speak to us in an audible voice. He can speak to us like he spoke to Samuel, but it's not very frequent what I'm saying is that, but he speaks. And sometimes when we hear that to the inner impression, you know, to the ears of our spirit man, we think God is speaking to us. Yes. And in one way, yes, God is speaking to us, but not the audible voice. That's what I'm trying to say. Saubhagya says, sometimes we get verses in our hearts. Is that God speaking to us? Yes. When we hear from God, you know, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He reminds us what the Holy, what uh, Jesus has spoken to us. Yes. <clears throat> so sometimes you're looking for an answer. You want to know, you want direction. Uh, God can just put a verse in your spirit, man, and that can be your answer. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, excuse me. No excuse questions? me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, Aniati, we can't Excuse hear you. Me. Sorry, I told you there is a problem with uh, uh, with uh, an issue with 
a glitch in the system today. So you'll, if you want to ask any questions, you'll have to post it in the chat section, please. Thank you. Yeah. Any Ati, can you please type it out in the chat section? Thank you. Okay, regarding, um, um, I think John's, um, John had posted, you know, about uh, the query about, uh, uh, yeah, John sir had said that, you know, the even if we get one option wrong, the whole answer is uh, we lose the points. Well, that is how the system has been set in Bible College. And so the, I'm just following the system that is set, uh, the set up for the MCQ. It's not something I invented. It's something that's already been set up. And so I'm just following the protocol. And also, I understand uh, it can be uh, quite uh, disappointing. But you need to know that all of the answers, um, all of the answers are in the publication. It's an open book exam. It's an open book test. And also the, the videos, the audio of the, the lectures are all available. You have a, a good time limit to the sun. So it's a good way to analyze how a student has been attentive in class and also listen and done um, the work of reading through. If you have not read through and prepared for your test, then yes, you can miss out if you read. And I know many people who have got scored full marks in my assessments, um, but I'm sure this is the first one. You just got a hang of it. You have three more to go, so don't get disappointed. You can do well in the next three, okay? But I think it's a good way to analyze and assess because it's an open book exam, and I think we can at least do that much, yeah. I hope I answered your um, query or concern, John. Thank you all for joining class. Have a blessed um, day. God bless you. Thank you.